Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective. So we were talking about the illusion of the self. <laughs> um. So yeah, in a few of his books, he he talked about how the self is an illusion, and in that video, he talks about it um, specifically how there's no um, neuroanatomical place for the self to be that all of our th- that a lot of our thoughts that we experience throughout the day like oh like you know i want i want to do this like what does this person think about me like we replay our thoughts throughout our day and we don't even realize it a lot of times i didn't realize it until i started reading his books and got into meditation how lost in thought i am throughout the day so um for me personally what i do is i try to keep that mantra inside my mind, oh, the self is an illusion, like, focus on the present. Um, Another thing that, uh, another mantra that I repeat to myself is overcome the illusion of the self by paying close attention to the present. Um, Wait, say that again? Overcome the illusion of the self by paying close attention to the present. That makes sense because the concept of self is not a concrete by definition whatsoever i mean it's like the most elusive thing ever to define and your perception of who you are is going to change rapidly like right now i mean it changes on a day-to-day basis but it's going to make like a drastic change every few years or so you know yeah like right now i might pride myself or hold my my particular attributes about myself in very high regard versus like five years ago i may have thought i'd just didn't have those attributes whatsoever yeah absolutely um like one attribute that i have to overcome every day in some ways and i'm a lot better than i used to be is like i always like people to perceive me as an intellectual like uh, i don't know if you know this like i'm always like reading a book or doing some shit like that and a lot of it a large portion of of it is because i'm interested in it but i do let it become an ego problem where i'm like oh, I want people to respect my opinion on religion or politics or um, whatever it is that I'm interested in, AI or climate change or whatever whatever topic it is that I'm interested in learning about. I want people to respect my opinion mm-hmm. on, that, on that topic, and it becomes an ego problem, if that makes sense. Absolutely, because you're, you're acting in ways to – you're you're like manipul you're trying to manipulate the perception of who you are to other people by presenting yourself in a particular way. Yeah. Dude, I've had the same problem. I've had the exact same problem, like with like intellect specifically. Yeah. That's that's interesting. That's really interesting. Have you ever have you this is a this is a random question, but have you ever gone through the phase of because I went through this for like ah, I'd say I'm still kinda like challenging it because I don't, but then simultaneously, I think I'm like kind of a dummy. I think I'm limited. I think I'm really limited as a person. And it's like, how could I know anything? You know, I'm only one person in this massive world. How could I know anything? You know, I, th- I think I know things, and I think I have a decent grasp on particular topics. But for the most part, it's I'm still very, very, very limited. Oh, absolutely. And other people's opinions. But the problem I face is – having like a pompous arrogant a uh, like perception of myself because i perceive myself to be intellectually superior than the general public yeah and it closes your mind up in many ways because then you're not able to learn and advance yourself on different topics that's why nobody likes a smart ass <laughs> yeah that's that's true what are uh, what do you what are your what are you intellectually interested in right now? Uh, that's a, that's a broad question. I I feel like I just I don't know. I'll like dive into this topic, dive into this topic, dive into this topic, and I I feel like I know a little bit about a lot, but there are very few things I know a lot about. Like I'm like very confident with talking a lot about this, if that makes sense. Like I know enough to talk to most people, but yeah, no, I'm absolutely. very humble and accepting that I don't know shit on a lot of topics. Like AI being one of them. Like I. I mean, I, I think I know a little about AI, but I don't think I know anything in comparison to a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm I'm reading a book right now. I set it down just because I got it, – it was honestly an re- incredibly hard read. Um, the reason why I got it was because 
it, one, it's something that I think is very concerning for the world in general. Um, I mean, I can explain it to you if you're interested. Oh, absolutely. Um, we got all the time in the world, baby. <laughs> um, so let's see. How do I even start this out? Um, so if you if you can develop a system that can constantly uh, reprogram itself to take the knowledge of what a team of researchers can do and then magnify that and do it in second, you know, minutes or seconds, that that grows exponentially. So if you have a if you have an algorithm that can constantly improve itself and improve itself and improve itself, and it doesn't sleep, and it doesn't sleep, it doesn't need food, it doesn't need anything except for uh, energy requirements, which might be a little bit expensive, but on the grand scheme of things, if you're able to develop all sorts of different um, cures for cancer, let's say, or if you're able to um, come up with solutions for uh, other problems that we have in our world, that in that could become problematic. I mean, who's who's going to be the person that's in charge of that system? I mean, take a, take for instance our court system. What if we could develop a, a system that could objectively determine which situation is right in the in the different scenarios? And how do we judge if it's objective or not? Exactly. Like whose values are we going to put into the system? It's a great point. That's yeah. a great point. And are we just going to leave it entirely up to the machines? That's going to lead to a lot of debate as well. Exactly. Because that's implying that they're completely superior, but they also – they're limited in a sense that they don't have, I guess, um, human, you know, human judgment in a lot of ways, or human ethics, or human morals. Exactly. Or they might not have our general well-being of humanity in best interest either, exactly. which a lot of people speculate to like lead to this like fatalistic viewpoint of AI and how it's going to take over the world and how we're just going to become the ant hill that. It, it just brushes aside. Yeah, that's, to so, that's totally accurate. So you know, you know a lot more. Like I'll tell people about this, and they'll be like, "No, no, no way!" Like that's not gonna happen. Like a lot of people can't um, marshal the the correct emotional response to be able to deal with it. I mean, I can't. I can't even fathom understanding like what one system can do. Like, what if China gets a hold? What if they're the ones who? develop the supreme artificial intelligence and they're able to manipulate uh our our brain functioning uh, you have it going into the 21st century we have companies like google and amazon who may be able to hack our minds through algorithms Wow, <laughs> I, I have that no sound, response. Is that, is that like out there? This is what. Um, no, I mean, I, I, it, yeah. it's so hard to quantify the progress of AI that it, like, I, I don't rule anything out. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I have no yeah. idea. It's so hard. It's just so hard to quantify it. Yeah, and like the more I learn, the more I learn that I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, are you familiar with Yuval Harari? No. Uh, he is. Was it you said Naval Harari? Y- Yaval. Yaval. Yeah. Oh, is that the author of Sapiens? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 He's he has some good content on on AI. If you're interested in. What's his viewpoint? Oh, he thinks it's something that he thinks that AI, climate change, and nuclear war are the three greatest threats to humanity. He sees it as a major existential threat to our existence. And that's the scary part about AI, at least in my eyes, is – or one element of it is the fact that it could potentially be an arms race. I mean it, it most likely is right now just Absolutely. because there's such an incentive for so many countries to get their hands on it first. Yeah, yeah. Vladimir Putin said um, the country that first develops AI will be the, will be the, the supreme ruler. That's wild. I'm very curious about the efforts being pumped into it and all the resources being pumped into it. Yeah. China is the only one that's really, from my understanding, they're the only one that's really taking it seriously. And China is not a country that is not at all a benevolent country. I mean, they they do some really messed up things. Like unethical? Oh, incre- incredibly unethical. Like what? Um, organ harvesting. They're, they're turning um, – 
detaining millions of people against their will because they're not Confucius or atheist. Um, there's a large Muslim population in their in their west, and they're not conforming to their, you know. Um, you said they're not conform conforming to Confucianism or, or atheism. Atheism's popular in China. Oh yeah, they're 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 like that's their. I don't want to say official religion, but that's what Xi Jinping is. He's an atheist. I've never heard of a country predominantly being atheist. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That almost implies the entire country is nihilistic in some way. Um, Not that atheism implies nihilism, but it's definitely a uh, a, a a conclusion one can draw from atheism. Yeah. Um. That's that's what their government pushes on them, and that's what they have declared for themselves um, as being. Uh, they they don't like Christianity. They don't like Islam. Um, you know, I'm I myself. It depends on the day, I guess. I mean, Would you say it's fair to say they don't like it, or do they just simply disagree with it? Oh, they don't like it. They don't like any form of religion. Interesting. That's yeah. I did not know that. I did not know that. Yeah. I guess I've never really put too much thought about China and their overall views on religion, though. Yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm not too familiar with Confucian Confucianism. It's not something I've really studied a whole lot, so I can't really tell you like what what it's about. I guess if it's it might be something similar to Buddhism. I've read some quotes by Confucius, and it sounds like that guy figured a thing out or two. He, he was definitely yeah. wise. He was definitely yeah. wise. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that you should impose – I don't think the state should impose their beliefs on someone and, and, and detain people because they don't conform to your religious belief. I mean, that's – I think that might be the definition of terrorism. And that's not – like, this is something it's that we It's definitely oppression. It's definitely oppression. Um and it's it's really weird because the the mainstream media does not talk about this topic with the does this have anything to do with the protests in Hong Kong um from my understanding the protests in Hong Kong had to do with um so they had some autonomy in terms of choosing choosing their judges choosing um their you know local leaders and stuff and stuff like that and China what do you mean by autonomy? Like it was selected from the top instead of like a democratic system yeah, electing so these it, officials? Yeah, it was – like they had some democratic – they had a democratic system for certain things. Um, but with Hong Kong uh, – but then China said, no, like we don't want you to have any, um, any, any form of democracy. We want to place these leaders in ourselves. Um, and then that, on top of the fact that housing is incredibly expensive in Hong Kong, um, that econ their economy is incredibly levered leveraged. Um, but housing for the same square footage in – unless I re remember the statistics incorrectly, but I'm pretty sure I read this twice. Housing Hong Kong for the same square footage is 12 times more expensive in Tokyo or New York. That's wild. Expensive. That's absolutely insane. And the reason because we think of, I mean, you think of New York City and you think of the most expensive city in the United States. I know when I was yeah. in San Francisco, it was considered more expensive than uh, New York City at the time. But I don't. You think of one of the most expensive cities in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the reason for that is is because the Chinese government they only allow, they have a pretty good connection with the billionaires that are in Hong Kong and there are only a couple property develop developers and so they've kind of monopolized yeah, it. Yeah, they've monopolized it and they 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 have control over their their land essentially and that's why housing's so expensive. So that's another facet of Does that have anything to do with Hong Kong being predominantly more capitalist because the British and the British took over Hong Kong and then implemented their own um, what would you say, economic policies on Hong Kong, and then they, they ch pretty much chose capitalism in comparison to communism. Mm -hmm. So that was is, does that have anything to do with the backlash and why the, gov the Chinese government's trying to control Hong Kong so much, and there's like this push and pull 
yeah. going on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they they like democracy. They like capitalism, because uh, it. You know, I mean. And they see I, they fan, they yeah. see the Chinese government almost implementing communism as a form of oppression, which it kind of is. I mean, it pretty much is. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane. Wow, that's that would be really bizarre to be in like a be in a city and believe in your city but not believe in the almost like totalitarian regime being run by your actual country. It's like nationalism yeah. within your city but not with your country. Yeah, um yeah, their their relationship is is pretty bizarre and I don't know the exact politics behind it. Um, they, but China does have a significant amount of control over Hong Kong. Um, they do have their own currency, but that in and of itself has a lot of problems. Um, so they do have somewhat monetary autonomy. You know, they don't use the, the yen or the, the remedy, which are China's two currencies. Um, I did not know that. No, yeah, they have the Hong Kong dollar. Interesting. Um, one of my favorite fund managers names, uh, Kyle Boss, he uh, he says that their their monetary d- system is is um, in shambles. Is is really um, he he thinks that there's going to be something similar to the Asian currency crisis in '97 when the Thai bot the Thai bot broke its peg with the dollar. So right now the Hong Kong dollar has a peg to the dollar. It's like eight Hong Kong dollars. For every one dollar, but since interest rates have diverged and rates in the U.S. are higher than they are in Hong Kong, they're spending down all of their dollar reserves to maintain their peg with the dollar. Um, what do you mean by peg? So for they, they have to have eight point. It's like eight point four or something like that dollars for Hong Kong dollars for every U.S. dollar. And if the peg breaks, what happens is capital will flee the country um, because of uh, inflation. What do you mean by capital fleeing the country? So people will take their investments out of their out of Hong Kong's economy and put it somewhere else. Oh. And yeah, that will cause a housing price collapse, which it should collapse given that rents just – ridiculously high in Hong Kong and they have an incredibly leveraged banking system. Do you think this is almost intentionally being implemented by the Chinese government? That Um, this is like almost inevitable and they're just kind of pushing the economic policies they're going to make it collapse? Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't, yeah, I mean, um, China, from my understanding, is they do a lot of, um, very nefarious manipulation in terms of capital flows um, and um, and what that does having having your currency propped up the way that they have it even though it really shouldn't be propped up because China has so much leverage their banking system is incredibly leveraged their corporations are incredibly leveraged the firms listed here on the New York Stock Exchange don't have to comply with GAAP, and on top of that, they're bleeding cash. Their cash flow statements look terrible. Um, but the reason why is because if investors saw that, investors saw if investors saw that um, their form of socialism or whatever you want to call it doesn't work, then capital will flee their country and it will go into more productive places. Um, you'll see a huge, um, a huge decline in economic output as a result of that. And another thing that they do, which is terrible, this is this is one uh, a horrible thing that China did. Um, but they don't they, now after 2015, when um, investors started fleeing. I don't know if you remember, but at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, we saw a drop, a huge drop in the stock market. And a large part of that was because um, investors noticed that there was a huge problem with um, China's leverage. Um, 
I forget that I think their three their debt's three hundred percent of GDP. Uh, to put that into perspective, when Greece went under, I think theirs was like two hundred percent of GDP, and that's a small country relative to China. China is now the second largest economy in the world. Uh huh. Um. So yeah, I mean the the global financial system. When you hear about people say, oh, it's like just a house of cards, like it really kind of is. Um. Um, I kind of went off topic. I forget what exactly I was talking about. Wait, so China is in a lot of debt as well? Oh, yeah. To who? To their creditors, whoever's um, issuing them credit, American investors, British investors, people who are yield-hungry, whoever's willing to supply them the credit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a good question, though. I've never, like, sat down and, like, thought about who, uh, if they're, from my understanding, the central banks don't have very much exposure to China. I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't think they do. So, what do you think about the United States debt crisis? Do you think we're ever going to end up paying that back to China? Because it, to me, it's just never made too much sense that one generation of Americans is going to cause this massive problem of yeah. trillions of dollars of debt to, to uh, I guess, fund innovation, fund progress, whatever you want to say. I totally agree with you. And um, then they are just going to feel that the next generation that comes in that had absolutely nothing to do with that just because you were born into this economic system – uh, not that you shouldn't be prideful or like happy to be here, but the fact that you are by chance thrown into this, how are you gonna have to? How are you expected to pay off that debt that your ancestors left for you? That just that just doesn't make sense. How that would ever roll over? Totally agree. Um, I have three things to say on that, maybe four. Um, so I think that our debt position to China isn't necessarily that big of a deal i mean it it is i guess it is a big deal but when you look at it comparatively um china's stock of debt is much greater than that than that of the u.s um you can that uh, is so surprising i've never heard that before you think you think once they like you're going to talk about debt to another country you're going to talk about that other country's debt but that's to me that's never been i've never heard that before yeah yeah our stock of debt comparatively is much less than than china's is um the the second thing i have to say though is i totally agree with you it, it, this is something that really pisses me off um i consider myself to be like more fiscally conservative i think that we should have a balanced budget um i'm tend to be in favor of uh you know more basic tax tax code um, I don't know, maybe someone like George Bush, like a moderate Republican. Like, that's, like, my political view. Someone who actually cares about the deficit or who cares about the future of the country. Um, ever since Donald Trump got elected, the Republicans did, like, a 180 like that. You talk to a Republican, and there's, like, totally cognitive dissonance. Like, like well, look at the deficit. That's 5% of GDP when employment's saturated. And they're like, no, well, like, employment, unemployment's low. Look how good the economy is. I'm like... Yeah, that's the same thing you were harping at, at the Obama administration when the deficit was half of that. Government spending's increased under Donald Trump. Like this contradiction. Guy, yeah, like they're total hypocrites, and it's kind of unfortunate because I think that a lot of the Democrats don't really care about the deficit, um, and we have a very notable example. Or I mean, we have several, but the most. Um, uh, the biggest one is Japan. Japan's been has basically had the past two decades of no growth. So you're having people having to work till they're seventy, um, just because in this time, say thirty years ago, their politicians did the same thing. Well, I'm gonna keep spending and spending and spending and borrowing money, so that way I can get reelected. I think that that's really really stupid. Like I just can't understand how our politicians can't just look at the bigger picture and see that, you know, they're adversely affecting the growth for future generations to pile it into... Short-term growth. Yeah, short-term growth. So it's like a personal incentive to sacrifice the future 
in order to get what you want selfishly for the present. Exactly. Yeah. So do you think do you think if the incentives there that if we were to just wipe this slate clean with debt and everything hypothetically that we would be able we would move into the future and do you think debt would reoccur? Like do you think the same thing would happen again? Um, you know, there's a book that um I was reading. I put it down. It was kind of weird because it was a PDF and I didn't really like how it was printed. Um but he says that uh, it's by Ray Dalio. He's um, he's a fund manager at Bridgewater, very successful guy. Um, he says there, there's four stages of a debt crisis where um, you have it going up and up and up. The yeah. the debt going up. Yeah, um, and then after that you have um, uh, you start to get investors become spooked. Then after that, you have massive inflation. And then after that, you have um, growth decline significantly. And then people become aware of that. People are you know, cognizant of the adverse effects of leverage on an economy. And then the economy starts to pick up. And right now, we're seeing that with Greece. Peak to trough GDP, GDP in Greece declined 30%. So their output declined. 30%. That's a ton. To put that into perspective, during the Great Depression, our output declined only 3%. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, but now, like, their, their economy is doing pretty well. They're generating a, a surplus of 2% of GDP and their, a budgetary surplus of 2%, and they're growing at 2%. That's incredible. Here in the U.S., we're, we're running a 5% deficit on top of a 2% growth. So, I mean, that's that's really bad. That's, like, negative three if you really think about it. That's, like, mm-hmm. it's like getting your credit card out and then, like, I don't know. Let's say you make $50,000. I mean, this is this is a really rudimentary argument. But let's say you, you make $50,000 a year. You put 5% more than your income on your credit card, but you only pay off 2% of it. You're not doing very well financially. But Republicans have convinced themselves that somehow that's— Convinced themselves or convinced the public to support their agendas. Yeah, I guess. I don't really know what, what you—however you want to want to put it. But I've talked to, s- to several, like, like Republicans, and they're just—they cannot understand that. Like, that's—it, like, it goes right over their head. They're like, no, the economy's good. Like, look at how—I had a, a girl come over, and she was like, oh, like— we understand that your household's Republican, like, and I was like, yeah, I'm not very, I'm not a very big fan of the deficits that the Republicans are running. Like, you understand that it's, and she mentioned she had kids, like, it's our generation that's going to have to pay that debt off. And she's like, well, look, Trump's going around to different nations and talking to them. I'm like, who gives a fuck? Like, the guy's kind of a fucking idiot. Like, I'm sorry. Are you a fan of Trump? Like, I'm not. I'm pretty impartial when it comes to politics. You are? Okay. I, okay. I, I I adopt the almost agnostic belief of I just don't feel like yeah. I know a ton about the whole entire pop or yeah. uh, what am I saying the entire topic so I just hold, don't hold much of an opinion. Yeah, yeah. I I need like that's like that's actually an ego problem that I I deal with as we were talking about ego problems like I used to be overly political like you know talk about politics with different people and um but yeah, that's that's an ego problem. So I have to catch myself. I caught myself. Well, it might be an ego problem, but it also is a really good thing, and that shows that you care. It ca- you show it shows that you care enough to educate yourself, inform yourself on very important topics. Versus, yeah. I mean, I I would argue that's better than choosing the route of like ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Um, like going back to the topic of the arms race with artificial intelligence. Yeah. yeah. The number, my understanding of the number three countries that are competing for it right now would be Russia, China, and the United States. Is that correct? Um, so I don't. I from my understanding, it's just our corporations that are doing anything with artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, like the CIA might be doing it at like a basic level to uh, um, compile data to track terrorists or something like that. And I'm sure they're they're doing stuff like that, but they're not. Um, they're not making it a huge grand strategy to develop 
super intelligent. Or are we just not aware of it? Um, oh, that's a good point. I, I, where's that military budget going? You know, are they raising these, finding these 15 year old like wizards on a computer, or wizards that into programming or engineering, whatever that, whatever the, the, uh, competencies they need are going to be. And then they find these kids and they pretty much teach them, Hey, this is what we need. And they kind of have like set goals for them and pretty much get young employees. I mean, they don't necessarily have to be young, but like the point being people, capable of being able to help advance this arms race for their particular country i would I, I would argue there's something going on that we wouldn't ever fucking know about like very under the scenes possibly government funded and who knows yeah no i could see that i mean i didn't even really think about that i just assumed like yeah that's what would you speculate though? Like if, if, like what would happen if I never thought about that? Do about you, that to be honest, the United States was like the first country to get it. What would happen if Russia was the first country to get it? What would happen if China was the first country to get it? Obviously, we're only speculating and hypothesizing because who fucking knows, dude? You could go so many goddamn directions with that. But it, what, like, what would you what would you say if you had to? kind of speculate the future if we were to discover make some major breakthrough in ai like tomorrow i guess it depend on what technology came out if it was used for military hopefully fucking not um i don't know if it was used to gather data in some really just a uh, wild way that's almost unimaginable yeah um well that that country would be significantly richer than what it, it is today. Um, I mean, if to say things like um, uh, the um, you know people in like Southeast Asia who are who are making um, you know garments for us, if there's a machine intelligence that could um, create a better create like a better way to do that and then automate all those tasks then what happens to all of their jobs um that's you know I, I i don't know i can't even marshal like like i said like i can't even like think of the correct response do you think economic policies are going to have to be i guess restructured oh, in yeah. some way i, yeah. I the, how how could they not how could they not? If they, if all of these jobs become obsolete tomorrow, if they all become antiquated next week, then what happens? What happens with all these people that aren't able to work? Like they, they want to work, they're willing to work, but their job is simply obsolete. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can give you. Um, I can give you two different perspectives, and I don't really know which one's the better of the two. Um, well, some form of UBI, or you could look at it from the perspective of throughout throughout the past, uh, you know, three centuries, humans have always thought that. So, like when um, when cars first became available, you used to have there were there were strikes at different plants, at, at horse and buggery buggy factories, because they were worried that all of their jobs would go to these cars. But now, like, how important are horses and buggies to our society? Um, but those those cars and the manufacturer of cars, Henry Ford, they are going to create new jobs. Yeah. So that's the other perspective. And we don't really know. But if a AI is just such a massive leap, and maybe it's just massive because, I mean, it's massive. It's massive. But maybe it seems more massive because – we're speculating on it and it's all like in our imagination and it could go so many different fucking routes and it's inevitably going to alter the course of human history. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I don't know, maybe it will create jobs, but how, if there are 8 million trucking jobs in the United States alone and all of those become obsolete next week, there's no way those truckers are going to have the skills and the yeah. competencies capable of, to have any utility in that new job market if there is even a new job market 
that's going to exist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's another thing. I mean, we we thought that, you know, a year ago, if you would have asked me, I thought autonomous driving was, like, here. Like, I thought that that was coming. Um, I read an article recently that said that, that it might be a little bit longer, if it's even possible. Um, but, yeah, if you have an artificial intelligence that can – take as much data as is possibly available and use and manipulate that data to create something like autonomous vehicles um, and then you and then that same super intelligence is able to know where all of the oil reserve the lucrative oil reserves are because you're giving it enough data over you know whatever time period um, and it can do it within minutes, and that same super intelligence is able to completely navigate space, that firm or that country is going to become incredibly wealthy. They're the ones that are going to be the, the, the rulers for many, many, many years. Does that imply that inequality is going to get extremely um, just, just – like the gap in inequality is going to get even worse. Yeah, yeah. And Especially if, like, a f- I mean, a first world country is going to develop it. There's no way like Africa's well, like, coming up with it or Uganda yeah. or whatever. But yeah. oh, it could be China. China's not. China's still they, a developing. Country. What are they? Are they second? Second what? Second world country. Um, they're they're still considered the developing country in the. I don't know exactly how you quantify it. Um, I know their growth is much higher. Their growth, their their leverage growth, although our growth is leverage growth too. Um, but yeah, they're they're technically classified as an emerging market or a developing economy. And I don't know how. Does that mean like between two and one, two on its way to one, or? Um, yeah, I mean, so they're they're on their way to being a developed com- country. Um, I don't know what your per capita income has to be. So, like, the United States, obviously, is a developed country. Canada, um, most of Western Europe is considered developed. Um, I guess you have to have, like, a certain per capita income. Um, I'm trying to think of the numbers. Or maybe, like, a certain standard of living or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So, like, our um, – we have like a quarter of the people that China has. They has they have about 1.2, 1.4 billion people. Um, we have about 300 million. Our income, even though we have a quarter of their population, our income is still much larger than theirs. Not much larger, but it's like a trillion or two. Our output, economic output, is still like a trillion or two larger than theirs is. So, um, so I mean, per capita, they're about a quarter poorer than what we are, if that makes any sense. Right, right. So I don't know what level it has to be to to get to that point. Interesting. I, I, I know I didn't answer your question, but... Oh, it's fine. Yeah, that's still interesting to ponder because, I don't know, you kind of, you think of, you think of China as this world power and then you kind of assume that it's going to be a first world country. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. AI, man. AI, bro. <laughs> Yeah, it's just intense. It's um, if you get the chance, you can you can watch Yabal Harari talk about it, or Sam Harris has a really good um, podcast on it, or uh, uh, um, what's it called? TED Talks. I'll watch them after this. No, yeah. at some point in the next week, I'll watch them. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I don't want to be one of those people that are like, hey, read this, watch that, like. No, I love when people are that way, and I used to kind of be turned off to it, but now it's like, give me that, give me that, give me that. And if somebody if somebody thinks it is worth my time, then most of the time I usually end up watching it. Yeah. And you get stupid recommendations, but this this is right up my alley, son. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go, and you'll like it. Uh, he does a, He definitely does a much better job talking about it than I do. It's a hard topic to grasp. Yeah. I don't even like I I still don't feel like like I feel like we're having a pretty educated conversation here about AI specifically, but 
I still don't feel like I know very much at all about it. Yeah, that's how I feel. Like, I mean, I've watched, like, a lot of YouTube videos. I read half of a book on it. Not not by any means that watching YouTube videos or reading a book on something makes you – not alone half a book makes you an expert on anything. But, like, by then, you'd think that you'd have, like, some, like, like grasp on it. I feel like we have a very rudimentary grasp. Exactly. But, like, the general public does it. Like, I remember I was out – when was this? This might have been like a year and a half ago, and I was out at a hot tub with like six or seven friends, and we're sitting around the hot tub drinking. It was like kind of a party day, and I brought up the topic of AI. Really? And one so of my friends. In the, in the, oh yeah, for sure. And I brought up the topic of AI because I was just being like introduced to it, and I'm drunkenly rambling about. <laughs> I'm like, dude, AI, and I kept saying AI, and one of my friends stopped me. They're like, "What's AI?" And I told them, and then, um. And then one of my friends kind of belittled me, and they're like, "What is like? What is this talk about all this?" And but I could tell that like they just didn't really. And I'm not, I'm not putting them down or belittling them for this, but they were almost like an archetypical example of the collective population of just being completely oblivious to any idea of what it even is on like the most rudimentary point of what AI is and the benefits and the potential consequences and the fatalistic viewpoints and I don't know, just, just the theories of what could emerge in the future and within our lifetimes. Yeah. I don't know. You think, you think you hear about something like this. Most people would know, but it, it's not here yet. And most people have no idea. I mean, it's definitely not talked about in the, in the mainstream media. I mean, it's not, I mean, like we, we could be, you know, developing some sort of God in some ways. Um, yeah. We think we're smart, but... <laughs> Some machine is ten times smarter than us. Yeah, it's wild. It's wild to speculate. It, it really is. I don't know I don't know where I stand on it, neither. I don't know if I have, like, a fatalistic point of view, or if I'm, like, getting cynical, or if I'm, like, optimistic. It's gonna change the world for the better. I just don't know. I, I could see it going so many directions, and that's the wildest part. Like, yeah. how, how, many, how many technologies have been introduced to human civilization that could go so north or so south? You know, like, whenever airplanes were introduced, for example, you might be like, okay, that could crash. That's a problem. Yes, it could crash, and it could kill, I don't know, 20 people on board whenever it does crash. Obviously, that's a catastrophe. That's, like, a huge problem. But that's nothing in comparison to like the entire world being destroyed potentially or this resulting in some arms race and then that results in like a world war over this technology yeah. or what whatever could happen like yeah. or the benefits of the airplane getting people around more conveniently at much quicker speeds than we've ever seen versus the benefits of AI just as a whole and the unemployment so that we're going to have to make some economic yeah, readjustments yeah. and potentially restructure the entire economic system of many countries, which could or could not be a bad thing. Is it, unpo is it unemployment or is it freedom? Who knows? But I don't know. It's wild. Yeah. Elon Musk is very concerned about artificial intelligence. I don't know if you have any a positive or I have a I'm I have a lot of respect for the guy. I think he has some personal issues. Um, really, like what? Um, well, for one, his company is incredibly leveraged. Um, he's taken it's not very profitable. He's he always lies um, about production. Uh, he tweets weird stuff. Um, I think his tweets are pretty funny. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like some of them I don't understand the humor behind, but I like I could tell there's a humor appeal there. Yeah. Um. He he totally violated SEC laws a little while back ago by saying his company was going to get acquired. Then he said that it wouldn't get acquired, and the reason why he did that was because he had what were called um, stock warrants, and this wasn't discussed in the media, but. I went through their rep their annual report and I noticed this, but they had uh, convertible bonds that they issued, 
and they like matured. They're going to mature soon, and the company had to use uh, their cash flow to pay it off. But if the stock price went up above a certain threshold, then they could cash out their warrants in stock, and instead of have instead of the company having to dole out money, which would really hurt their already precarious financial position, they um, didn't have to do that because they would just issue more shares and the investing public doesn't care because he's Elon Musk. Don't get me wrong, I think the guy's brilliant and I think that he's doing a lot in terms of getting us to space. I think that space exploration is really something that humans need to consider in the coming decades with population growth. Um, and with potentially a lot of other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's concerned. He has a genuine concern about climate change, which is something that I think is a major threat to um, humanity. Um, so he's doing a lot of good things. I mean, he's a good guy, and he's incru- and he's brilliant. I mean, that guy is so well read. But yeah, I think he has some personal issues there. And what com what company were you talking about specifically? Was that Tesla? Tesla, yeah. Okay. Um, his other company, though, so the Boeing company, or the Boring company, isn't very profitable, I don't think. But um, SpaceX, though, like, they get a lot of money from uh, the U.S. government. Like, from my understanding, they're fairly profitable. Really? Yeah. Wow, Tesla's bleeding cash, man. Like, they, like, bleed, like, a billion a quarter now or something like that. Maybe it's a billion a year. Uh, a billion a quarter, that sounds too much. I think what do you mean by bleed? So, um... They go negative a billion? Yeah, so... A quarter? A year, I think. Okay, it's still insane. Yeah. So, for 250 a company 250 million a quarter, wow. They've never made a profit either. Ever? Ever. They, they didn't Why? Is he, is he just trying to fund innovation as a whole, and then he's it's coming at the cost of profit, or... I do not know what's inside that man's mind. Um... But what I can tell you is uh, he's it's not it's not profitable and people are invested in it because he's Elon Musk. Like he has like a brand name to him. Mm-hmm. It's like his own fucking name, man. Like <laughs> What do you think that brand is? Do you think it's human innovation selflessly and altruistically yeah. and, and over personal gain almost do you think people kind of perceive him that way oh yeah and he like put all of his um uh he put like all of his car models available for other companies to use them because he says you know i want the the electric vehicle revolution to take hold you know i put he put his um his patents available online so other companies could replicate them so i think in large part he's doing it of altruism, but I think there's also... And just to push human innovation towards yeah. something that's more economic, or not economically, uh, environmentally sustainable. Yeah, yeah. Shit, dude. Um, that is just wild to think about. That it, It's almost bigger than his company. It's, it's pushing the market to where it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, the weird thing is, is like the Democratic politicians, like they do not have a good solution to climate change. Um, they just identify the problem and keep they restating just, it. Or? Yeah, it's like they identify the problem and it's just like a virtue signal for them. Like, uh, like they, the best thing to do would be to either price carbon and have some form of um, uh, cap and cap and trade system where companies can exchange permits to where they have to buy permits from the government to be able to pollute and slowly over time hopefully we come up with some solution for some form of um you know some energy efficient storage technology or company or nuclear power becomes more uh widely used as opposed to coal and gas fired power plants and Companies then use that nuclear power to power their electric vehicles and um, or just completely pricing carbon. And whenever you go to the gas station, you pay 
30 cents more for a gallon of gas mm-hmm. but that's not popular so it's a it's kind of like they don't really care about it if you look at their plans like they're they're not very good it's just like they're not good like i don't know how else to explain it like it's so everything you just mentioned it sounds like preventative focuses like preventing future damage is there anything to reverse it is there any is there any natural or not natural is there any technological innovations that are able to convert carbon into oxygen or is there anything that could just take the amount of methane and yeah. the amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, like uh, like something other than trees that could do it at a much r- more rapid pace. Yeah. Um, so there is uh, um, carbon sequestration, and Bill Gates is investing in. Um, there's some several startups that are working on this. Wait, what did you just say? Bill Gates. No, no, the the carbon. It's called carbon sequestration, where you take carbon out of the atmosphere and then store it in the ground. That's called carbon capture and storage. But then when you sequester the carbon, what do you do with it? It's just carbon. No one wants some carbon. You can't, you know, you can't Is there a way to solidify it? This might go back to my, like, terrible fucking understanding of what would that even be. Yeah, no. Just the elements. I'm not an expert of it by any means. Or maybe, like, put it in something that's solid that's going to absorb it at a very, like, efficient rate and then just fucking throw that in the ground. Um, yeah, that's, that's what, from my understanding, that's what they're trying to do with carbon capture and storage. It's just expensive, um, and it's difficult to do, but the price has gone down a lot, though. It used to be a lot more expensive. Now it's just expensive. (laughs) So progress. So we have made progress, that's for sure. Um, because for me, it just, it makes sense, yes, we should prevent future carbon emissions. Yes, yes, I agree with that. But it, it... it's never made sense that we focus more time on that instead of trying to reverse the problem. Unless reversing the problem is impossible, but clearly you just said it isn't. Yeah. Um, or at least there's some progress to imply that it's not at least impossible. Maybe it's yeah. slow progress to reverse it, but at least it's possible. Yeah. Something could be done. Yeah. Um, so one of, from my understanding, one of the problems with that is – like I said, the cost, but another problem is um, that it requires more energy to be able to do that, and where are you going to get that energy from? Wait, wait, are you saying more energy implying more carbon emissions? Well, I mean, unless you get all of the energy from a nuclear power plant or solar panels or whatever. Um, but no, you really piqued my interest, though, in um, carbon capture and storage because, like, everything that I've looked on the Internet, like, it wasn't really that. There, Just the technology really wasn't there. But um, I watched something recently. It was maybe a couple of months ago that, like, the, like I said, like, it was becoming more viable. Like, it was becoming, like, it was becoming possible. Um, if I remember correctly, the numbers now. If I remember the numbers off the top of my head, it was like five hundred dollars per ton of carbon, or something like that. So I don't know. I don't know. That's that's something I'll definitely look into, though. That's interesting. That's interesting. I'm curious if there are other ways as well. Because doesn't the ocean do something naturally yeah. to absorb carbon or something like that? And obviously, all the all the natural ways we've kind of surpassed. Like otherwise, we wouldn't have this problem if we were if the carbon emissions were equal to the amount of output of oxygen that the ocean and that, uh, again, I don't know how the ocean does it, but I know it does something with reversing it, um, or trees, yeah. like we, we want to be having this problem, yeah. but I don't even remember the point I was going to make, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a good point though. So that, so you're right. The ocean absorbs about 90% of our carbon, um, I read a couple of articles. I read one recently. What though, a beautiful that fact. <laughs> that's that's insane. That's really insane. Yeah. Um, How does it do it? Do you know? No. Um, that's wild. But there are problems with that, though. Like, we're seeing um, fish populations decline, not from overfishing, but from what's called ocean acidification, where the ocean actually becomes toxic to the fish because 
they don't have the ability to survive with as much oxygen as they have. I guess now that I'm saying this in my head, I don't know. Does that's just from my understanding. Ocean acidification kills fish. So it's almost as if the ocean absorbs some of the carbon emissions, and then that pollutes the ocean. But like unintentionally, because we're all worried about the atmosphere, and like whenever we say the environment, we're kind of worried about more so the atmosphere and the air, not yeah, the air yeah. quality, but more so the the heat of the world heating up um, other places, and then like permafrost that's yeah. going to be, and all the carbon emissions and methane that's buried underneath of there, yeah. that's going to be released if we yeah. hit that threshold, which is really really fucking scary. Yeah, absolutely. But. We, we don't think about the oceans. At least I don't. That's not where yeah. my mind goes whenever I think about the environment and, and climate change and just uh, this problem at hand. Yeah. Um, but no, you um, – yeah, you, you, may, you make a good point, like, with the oceans. Um, from the articles that I read, it, it said that the, the oceans aren't absorbing as much carbon as they once were. Like, it's becoming saturated. Like, they can't take in – any more carbon so we're having that so there's a threshold with the oceans yeah. while the problem continues to get worse it continues to be exacerbated it's going to be exponential man it's going to be exponential i mean think about like like you said like you have all of the methane that's trapped under the permafrost in the arctic that's becoming released you have all of the um you have the wildfires in brazil california all throughout the the world really wildfires have increased which is paradoxically killing the thing that's helping us yeah trees so and then those fires release more carbon into the atmosphere so it's like a total death spiral of more and more and more carbon it's just one problem after another and then i i just i don't have a very optimistic point of view with like the amount of progress being made to prevent much less um turn around what was the word um, um shit <laughs> uh yeah i know pre- what you mean prevent like re- restore restore like yeah. restore the problem and re- reverse, reverse reverse the problem of climate change itself yeah. it just doesn't seem like the progress is going to keep up with the amount of output of carbon emissions and then that's going to reach that threat ho- threshold which is going to inevitably i mean melt all of the ice and then let up and then melt the permafrost and then that's going to release the methane that's released under there and then what the fuck happens after that do we even have a quantif like a realistic quantifiable measure of what how much methane is going to be released do we have an estimate or do we or do we even have an estimate of if the estimated amount of methane and carbon emissions underneath that permafrost that's released do we have an estimate yeah, of what an is estimate? realistically going to happen? Like, what are the fatalistic effects of that whenever the the world reaches that point of temperature increase? Like, like what happens? Does Do the ocean levels just rise, like, to some wild degree that, like, fucking Canada's underwater? Like, all of Florida's gone? Yeah. Like, what happens? We... Um... If I remember correctly, uh, given the current estimates, I think by 2050 or 2060, we're supposed to be like a meter, um, or global sea levels are supposed to be like a meter higher. You know, now that I think about it, that seems too high. Maybe it's a foot. I wish I could remember. Which doesn't sound like that much. Oh, that's it's a like, lot. It's like, oh, it's only a meter. That, that's, that's a insane. lot, man. That's a ton. I mean, that's like all of Florida. My grandma just bought property down there, and she's... You know, she's, like, a huge, you know, like, Trump supporter. So if I mention climate change, like, she's huge. You know, like, she's one of those people that, like, like, if you talk about, like, she thinks that I'm a Democrat because I don't like Donald Trump. Like, you know, I'm a, I like to consider myself as, like, a political moderate. But she, like, she's one of those people that I can't even say anything about that to at all. And it's, like, you're buying really shitty property. Like, the reason why it's so cheap is because of climate change. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't disagree with you either. And the fact that climate change has been politicized is pff, so fucking stupid, dude. This just should be, this should be a collective effort moving us all forward yes. toward yeah. the problem at hand. We shouldn't be debating if it's actually a thing. Yeah. That's wild. 
there are probably monetary incentives. There are probably economic incentives to refute the fact that it's even a problem. They, otherwise, why would it be debated? There have to be some incentives. Otherwise, it, it, it wouldn't be debated otherwise. True. No, uh, there's uh, the coal lobby. Even though they don't employ that many people, the coal lobby is huge. The oil and gas lobby is huge. Um, Washington D.C. in and of itself is huge. <laughs> Um, it's it's like why why money maybe they say jobs for these people they're gonna deflect the problem to or the the cause to something else you know what I mean what do you mean like they're going to say oh, yeah. the oil industry has this many yeah. employees so we need to keep these people employees clean oil clean coal yeah and but coal can't like coal can't be clean it's not sustainable. Gases. Yeah, natural gas isn't sustainable, but it's a good bridge. But like what is the incentive for the backlash of that energy source to be used? What do you mean? Like, oh. what what would the, the economic or political incentives be? Well, I mean, it's – okay, so think about, like, wind and solar. They're really not great sources of energy. I mean, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And to store that energy is very expensive. Like, a Tesla Powerbolt is $7,600. And it might it might power a family of four's electricity needs for a day or so. So you go a couple of days with bad weather, you're you can be out of power for a day. I mean, like that doesn't even sound like that big of a deal, like in the grand scheme of things. When you really look, take a step back and look at the ramifications of what climate change is likely to do to us. But people don't want to make that sacrifice, you know. I mean, people don't want to do that i mean and same thing with cars that's even more difficult um electric vehicles are significantly more expensive than petrol cars um granted the cost is coming down but still you have that problem what are you going to tell to all the countries in um africa i mean are you going to say you guys have to use nuclear power for all of your your um energy needs what if a terrorist group gets a hold of that nuclear energy so i mean we we're not in a good situation <laughs> no matter what way you look at it we're really fucked <laughs> so so if carbon emissions reach that threshold to where sea levels rise and all of this catastrophe happens like inevitably a fuck ton of people are gonna die yeah. like a ton of people are gonna die who knows even maybe me and you yeah. but like who's gonna who's gonna be the worst off would it would it be the developing country? countries, developing countries by far, because they're the ones. Think about it. They're the ones that are in the tropics. They're the ones that are going to have, um, already have food problem, like problems with just feeding themselves, um, and on top they're going to have uh, migratory problems. What we saw in Syria that was, in part, you could argue due to climate change because you had a lot of the people in who were farmers come into the mainland and that caused problems so maybe it's not maybe the the famine the five-year famine or drought would have happened had climate change had we not put any carbon emissions into the atmosphere whatsoever but still though i mean the earth is warming no matter what way you look at it um do you think there'll be a scarcity of of resources as well and then that's going to potentially even starve some of those developing countries to death Absolutely, because that will likely result in a, like less less food, less yeah. water. Yeah, I think that climate change is something that humanity is going to look back on in the same manner that we look back at at the Holocaust, or the same way we look back at you know slavery. That this is something that the West did. Um, Do you think we'll understand it a little bit more? Because I, I with, as far as climate change, like I get why it's a thing. It's it's kind of the cost of progress, and it's a massive cost. It's a massive cost, but I see the machine of progress that's driving it. Yeah. Like that makes sense to me. Yeah, I, the, it, no, I get I what you're saying, though. I, I get the comparison. Get totally get it. Yeah. Like I, I told. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You're making massive progress, and it depends on your perspective, really, and it depends on um, what low carbon technologies we're able to come up with. And you mentioned reversing the the climate change epidemic. 
and I can go back to that on a second because there is geo geoengineering and that is something that could possibly be viable. Um, it could cause a lot of damage. As could well. you explain that real quick? Yeah, geo I know you're making a point, but no, you're you're totally good. Um, so like seventy two thousand years ago, human humanity actually almost went extinct. The reason why there's only about two thousand humans left. The reason why was there was a volcano in I think like Indonesia or present day Indonesia, something like that, that erupted and it spewed tons of aerosols into the atmosphere. And what that did was that blocked the sunlight and it caused I think it was a mini ice age is what it was called, but it caused like some form of ice age and it wiped almost wiped out humans. Um, because of all of the particles blocked the sunlight from entering into the atmosphere. Um, so that's what one of the programs that Bill Gates is actually working on. I forget, there are two different companies, or three maybe, that he's investing in um, low carbon technologies. Uh, so geoengineering? Yeah, geoengineering, yep. Wait, wait, so what is it exactly? Uh, oh, I've watched a YouTube video on it, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I don't even remember what it was, to be honest. Um, this is an example of geoengineering, um, but, <laughs> and there's a book that I read, it was called Freakonomics, but he basically advocated we should just build, like, giant coal stacks, um, coal power plants that go up, like, 13 miles into the atmosphere, and then make it so that way that the particles that are spewed into the atmosphere cool keep the planet cooler because they stay there and they block off sunlight from entering into i don't know if it's called the stratosphere or atmosphere but basically entering into where we live um yeah that's what it's called you spew the particles into the stratosphere and then it blocks the sunlight from coming into the atmosphere so the earth ends up getting cooler so like in beijing they have so many coal-fired power plants that and so many particles, uh, particles from aerosols is what they're called from the coal plants that it's estimated that the the city of Beijing would be four degrees Celsius cooler if they just shut up all of their their coal power plants. Why? Because they're spewing all of that, um, all of those particles into the atmosphere. But even though in longer term it's it's making the whole planet warmer. Does that make sense? So it has a cooling mm -hmm. effect short term. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Off. And I don't know, I've thought about this before, but I don't know how much warmer the world would get if we all just shut everything off because coal generates those um, sunlight blo blocking particles that I mentioned. Does that make sense? Is Absolutely, and that, that's similar to, to uh, like the ozone layer almost. Yeah, um... Because isn't that, like, a big part of the ozone layer? It, like, absorbs and, and deflects some of the... Or reflects uh, some of the sunlight? Yeah. Um, from my understanding, like, the ozone layer is closing up. Like, the people on the... People who politicize climate change will make this argument. Um, oh, like, the climate change isn't that big of a deal because the ozone layer is... Um, isn't as big of a problem. It's it's getting the the hole in the ozone is getting smaller. Well, yeah, that's true, but that's because there are a couple of different types of chemicals that we emitted, and the Bush administration took was really like a big leader on this. Um, and they decided that we're not going to pollute those types of chemicals that destroy the ozone layer because the ozone layer, like you said, has a cooling effect on the planet. Shout out George W. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's progress. Yeah. So. Is, is there any way to, like, make artificial ozone layers to make it thicker and then somehow – so with geoengineering, is geoengineering is almost like manipulating the planet's, I guess, um, manipulating the planet's temperature or, or – Pretty much manipulating the, the weather and everything. Yeah. That's what it is? Okay. Okay, I didn't fully understand that. It would have side effects, though. Um, some places would get drier. Um, some places would get wetter. Like, India would have more worse monsoons as a result of that, apparently, from what their research has done. 
and unfortunately climate you know it's climate change isn't like you know mathematics there's so many variables involved in tackling that just talking with you now like we've probably gone through like a fourth like just a fucking yeah, quarter yeah, of all the right. variables and there are so many variables yeah. that's uh, that's what i'm realizing like talking to you i because i consider you more educated on this topic than myself so talking to you uh about, the- about this it's like oh the ocean and then oh yeah the ocean isn't absorbing anymore and on top of that it's also killing the fish at the cost of putting carbon into the atmosphere and it, it's like well hope, like i was like kind of putting hope in the ocean and then it's like no we plateau yeah, yeah, on we that fucked. and also it's been killing fish for like however many years it's like oh shit okay trees it's like you know the amazon's burning down right now it's like oh and that's more carbon it's just like you know it's just so many variables it's crazy if you're interested in the topic, I have a book that you can read. Um, it's not like an enjoyable read. It basically just says we're fucked. <laughs> so I would read it. I would read that. I yeah, I'll let you borrow. I'm it not cynical, sure. but I like reading cynical points of view. Yeah, it, it's not. He's he's actually. I mean, he's like a leading guy on the topic. I mean, his his name's Joseph Rom. Um, he. Uh, He's a, like an, he has like a PhD from civics at MIT. I mean, the guy's super qualified to talk about it. The guy definitely knows what he's talking about, and he runs you through all of the situations that would occur under a three degree Celsius scenario. Um, the book is gonna scare the shit out of me. Yeah. What Which would that be equivalent to in, in Fahrenheit? So I think 1.6, so three times. Five point four degrees Fahrenheit higher, and that'd be like average per year. Yeah, on average. Okay. So, but, and the thing with climate change is, since the polar ice caps are melting, that has two negative reasons. Well, actually, a few more. But um, one of them is when without the ice caps, we have more dramatic temperature swings because the the ice caps stabilize, um, help stabilize temperature. Uh, it causes our temperature to fluctuate a lot more. I don't know if you, I mean, I remember growing up like, it, we wouldn't have scenarios where it would be seventy degrees in January and then negative twenty the next day. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed that? I am somebody who just deals with the weather, yeah. so it's, it's hard. But it, I get what you're saying. I but I mean, like, saying. you'll have record-breaking days where it's incredibly cold, and then record-breaking days the next week where we're making highs. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I guess I have noticed that as time's going on. So wait, how do, how do the ice caps regulate that? You know, I don't know. They somehow regulate the temperature, though. That's why, because whenever I think of the ice caps melting, the first thing that comes to my head is the obvious one of sea levels rising and then some of these coastal cities just being completely fucked. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, without the ice caps, so this, with the ice caps, they... Um, they reflect sunlight back into the atmosphere. But without those ice caps, we have more sunlight penetrating into the atmosphere. So that's the positive feedback cycle. It's not called positive because it's a good thing. It's just the, the term that when you have something, one reaction happen, it causes another reaction, and it causes another reaction. That's just like a chemistry term or something like that. I don't mm-hmm. know where wow. that would from. That's unreal. You wouldn't think the ice caps were that necessary, but that's unreal. That's absolutely insane. Which, by the way, Antarctica is the largest desert in the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I learned crazy. that the other day, because a um, desert is technically measured by the amount of rainfall, and they get, like, less than yeah. whatever it may be for desert. But, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Dude, that, that is, that's wild, though. That's wild. And then, where is the permafrost at specifically? Is that in Greenland or? Um, let's see. Would that be somewhere in Antarctica as well, or just anywhere with ice caps? Because I, with the video I watched, it was a documentary on uh, that Vice did, yeah. and that was more northern, where they were talking about the problem specifically. But I would assume that permafrost exists, and then the methane being underneath the permafrost that would exist yeah. in just any. Uh, terrain that's covered in ice? Um, 
I mean, I don't know. It's, I mean, I know that there's permafrost in Siberia and Canada. Those are the two primary, prim, prim, primarily the two countries. Um, but I mean, over time, it's it's going away. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I don't really know where exactly that line is now. Scary shit, regardless. Well, I've talked about everything I want to talk about. Yeah, I'm I'm about good. I feel like really upset right now. I, I, upset. Don't I don't think I'm upset to get where I'm just like, yeah. we're, yeah, fucked. Yeah. we're fucked. We're yeah, fucked. Whenever you talk about the environment, it just, uh, just, it's never a good ending conversation. Yeah, and I mean that's good that you care about the environment. Like it's seldom that I meet people that like actually care. I, I feel like there's a shift in our generation that people are pretty passionate about the topic. Yeah, I see that with women more so than I do with men, though. I've noticed that as well. Women definitely care. I would and agree, I and I, why is that? I don't know. I have no explanation for that, too. It's like, like, it's like men, I think, like, they think, like, they're, like, they have, like, more, like, virility, or, like, they're stronger if they drive a big pickup truck or something like that. And that women are kind of more, maybe they feel more vulnerable to their physical environment. Maybe. So that makes them think about things more realistically, apparently. <laughs> That's funny though. Whenever I see a guy in a big pickup truck, mainly whenever he like accelerates and there's like a ton of exhaust I hate just that. coming out, dude. I this. I'm not saying this is right. I'm not advocating for this behavior <laughs> whatsoever. But I will drive up next to him. I will swerve through fucking traffic and I get right up next to him and I go, "Hey, buddy!" Like I'll like honk my horn. I I, I mean I've done this all the time. Funny. Yeah, I've done it a few times. <laughs> dude, I hate those people. Those people that like. It's like, let me just, like, spew all of the... Let me just waste gas on that shit, like... It's like a weird flex. Like, what, what would that even be? I don't understand it either. It's like... I don't know. It's just... It's super ignorant, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. And maybe... I, I don't know. Maybe they're doing it on accident, or maybe that's just the way their truck is. I, I don't know, but I think they're assholes. Yeah, yeah. I hate, like, breathing in the smell of pollution, like... I literally like I'm not as bad as I used to be, but like I'll schedule my days. I'll like get up in the morning so I don't have to like breathe in all the pollution and shit like that. <laughs> as bad as that sounds. That's funny. When yeah, I used kind of scheduling your day around it. Yeah. yeah. When I used to work in St. Louis, I would get up, make sure to get there like super early, like 30 minutes early before everyone else did, so that way I didn't have to like sit in traffic, even though it might just cost me like 10 more minutes to get to work, but that was, like, too much for me. I hate that shit. <laughs> I, I'm the same way. I don't like I don't like being stagnant whenever I'm in my car. I'd rather be moving. Yeah. Like, I'd, I think I'd rather drive 15 miles in comparison to 10 miles if I was constantly moving. Yeah. Even if I got there, like, five minutes earlier in the, in the 10. Yeah. If I was going, like, if I was stagnant for, like, five, ten minutes in that. Yeah. I hate that just sitting in your car. Breathing in everybody else's yeah. car farts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've talked about everything that I want to talk about, though. Same. This, is, dude, this was a lot of fun. This was a yeah, good time. This, oh, I, I, it's rare that I meet people like you, honestly. Like, same, it's, same. As weird as that sounds, like most people don't care about important things. <laughs> I mean, at least like at least we deem them to be important. Maybe they see. I don't know. I bet it's a college thing, too. And, like, where people are in their lives right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, people are just trying to get by. True. Just trying to get through this, this, uh... I shouldn't be so experience. cynical. Yeah, totally. And I bet, I bet people care about it more than you think. Because I will say this. On this podcast, people have surprised me. Like, consistently. Like, very consistently. Uh, I, I, because I try not to go into the, go into it with, like, any anticipating any expectations or anything like that. I just like I just want to sit down, enjoy a conversation and talk about cool shit. Yeah. And that, that's pretty much my only goal whenever I do these things. But you know, you kind of get those prejudgments or you get those estimations or predictions of where the conversation is going to go, what we might talk about. And my point being is that people have to consistently surprise me. Because mm -hmm. I, I will think, oh, we're just going to joke around. Like this is more of a this is more of a goofy guy, he doesn't, like, he, I don't know, he, he, um, 
I don't know. I think that's just the best way. That's the best way. People have surprised me, and people are a lot. That people think about a lot more shit than you give them credit for. Yeah, yeah. Because this is a this is a platform that you can connect with people on a, on deeper topics, and I'm not saying everybody. I'm just saying like a fair amount of people. Yeah. They think more than I thought they thought. Yeah. No, you're right, and I've I've been discovering that too. Like I used to be like way too I don't know, like nihilistic, if you if you will, like towards people but like I've changed a lot yeah totally and it, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of that podcast that is something I struggled with for struggled with for a little bit was like that that intellectual arrogance to where I came to this point in college where I was like well I'm curious about that then I started listening to podcasts I started reading books I started reading articles and just taking in as much cool information at least cool by my definition of the world as I possibly could and then I was like yeah, this is awesome, this is awesome. And after a few months, you start to distance yourself from your college buddies and what you're interested in and just the general public and, and like overall. And you realize that you're thinking about more complex things than the general public. And then you start thinking, you start getting kind of arrogant about it. At least, I'm just saying, this is my own uh, I'm, I'm personal totally, experience. I'm totally the same way. And you start getting arrogant about it. You're like, everybody else is fucking dumb. Like, why do people not care about this? Yeah. And I'm not saying that those thoughts never come into my mind now. I've, I've become more conscious of that mindset and thrown them aside. Because at the same time, even though I, I do think, I don't think I'm smarter than the general population, but I think I'm a lot more curious than the general population, which has resulted in me seeking out different information. I don't think people are, are dumb. I think they're maybe ignorant, not by choice. They might be, um, I don't know, they might not realize that they like certain topics because they haven't taken the time to expose themselves to that or the, the information, the right information hasn't come to them. Or they haven't even realized that that part of themselves that is curious, that part of themselves that works hard, or that part of themselves that's like very passionate about something. So that that was kind of the conclusion I came to is that I I really I think I'm I think I'm kind of smart, but I think I'm pretty fucking curious, and I think at the same time I'm I'm actually pretty stupid, and I think I'm really limited. I think I'm very limited on like what I could possibly take in because I'm only one person. Yeah. But I will say this this podcast too, it exposes you to a lot more information and a lot more perspectives on the world and um, I don't know, you, you get to I've gotten better at look, like looking at things more objectively. Really? Yeah. Like just just whenever somebody yeah. throws out an opinion that you maybe have never thought about or an an opinion that disagrees with you, you kinda look like an asshole if you're like on, on the screen and like you're wrong, you know, and I'm just like quick yeah. to debate them instead of like, why do you think that? And then I'm, I try to understand it from their yeah. point of view. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Like, I, it, and I, yeah, my conclusion might still be, you know what, man, I, I disagree with you, but I see where you're coming from. Yeah, that that's definitely sense? like, like uh, the way to look at things. I would totally agree. Like, you should have like that mentality of. Yeah, like I, I dis I disagree with you, but like like you said, I disagree with you but I see where you're coming from. So at least you're actually least. yeah, at least you're actually thinking about it. Like you're considering their point of view. Absolutely. I got my biases just like anybody else, but it's it's something I'm trying to slowly evolve towards and then who knows, I might find a a way of thinking or a way of considering objective or different uh, differing points of view that I consider better than that. So who knows? That's just what I'm striving for now, and it's slowly evolving, and I'm getting better at it, but still a lot of room to fucking improve. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's, yeah, now I've officially said everything I wanted to say. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see you at that then. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, man. That was fun.